So, Tom, we've yes. I've given you a little introduction there, but your biography is rather unusual. It started not as a designer, but as a musician. Can you fill us in with that? Um, yeah, it was totally normal for everyone in the UK to be in a band, right? At the time, now everybody's, <laughs> everybody's more a DJ or a software designer, right? But now, um, so I was in a band, it, it took off. We had a, a record deal. I was a professional musician for two years. Um, I crashed into a car, broke my arm, and was On replaced. On your motorbike? Yeah. And so I'd, um, I'd already started uh, making things, and um, people started buying them, and that's how I ended up as a designer. And you started first as, you know, with welding, is that right? Um, yeah, I, I learned to weld, not to design, just to make things, and I made a lot of things, and people started buying them. So I was, I was kind of inspired by... Um, the transformation of, of rubbish into gold, really. So just, just the, I think too many people that go to art school are, are, um, don't encounter the commerce um, very early on. It's all theoretical. But for me, I had to sell work to make the next piece. And so it was always interlinked. So let's talk about Tom Dixon, the designer. Tom Dixon, the brand. When did you, well, we know when, but why did you make the decision to create an eponymous brand? Um, I tried every kind of way to, to design. I'd, I'd been a, a, a very poor craftsman, making things with my own hands. I'd, um, uh, I'd worked for the Italian luxury companies like Capellini and Moroso that, that were amazing companies, but um, I wasn't very good at designing to order. I'd got a job in a corporation, um, which was Habitat at the time, and um, which was a, a, a mid-market company with maybe 70 or 80 shops in Europe um, as head of design and then creative director. And I'd learned a lot about the furniture business, but ultimately I didn't want to be, you know, as in the previous conversations, a, a chief design officer or working as a service to, to bigger companies. I wanted to have design as the business, as it were. And it's a familiar model, in, um, particularly in fashion design, where, where people tend to have their companies under their own names so they can have a degree of control over not just the design, but the way things are made and the way that they're shown, the way that they're communicated and, and the direct contact with the customer. Um, but it doesn't happen so much in, in product design. In fact, it doesn't happen at all. And so I thought once I'd, I'd finished, uh, you know, I wanted to jump ship from corporate life, I, I, sh I should try and do it <clears throat> maybe mimicking a bit more um, how fashion designers do it. And so I started my own label and, and very quickly discovered that it's much more difficult than it looks. And particularly in, in furnishings and lighting and accessories, which is what we do, um, it tends to be... Um, a business which is split up into lots of different manufacturing brands because they're all very different challenges with very different manufacturing challenges and distribution challenges. And um, there is a danger, and we've talked about it, because it happens in the fashion industry, of course, that once you have this name, you can, often, you can lose the name. It's happened in fashion with, with Jill Sander, with Margiela, Helmut Lang. You, you can lose control. Has that ever been a, a fear, a, a trepidation? Well, yeah, I didn't think of it at the beginning, but you know, very early on, because I was trying to create a larger entity I, I got invested in, and of course I'm now a minority owner in my own name, um, which <laughs> gives you this kind of um, out-of-body experience. Right? <laughs> it leaves you um, really quite vulnerable and, 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 and also you have to kind of separate your own personality from what becomes the, the, the label or, or, or the yes. brand, if you want to call it that. And um, it's, it's a, a very peculiar situation to be in. Yeah. Well, let's, we have some, some work showing here. Can you talk us through a few of the, the key pieces you've created since setting up the eponymous brand? Well, you told me I could only have four slides. And of course, you know, we've got 600 things in the selection. It's very hard to... It's and again, all in the edit, Tom. It's all in the edit. If you say so. <laughs> um, but um, so we do furniture and we do a lot of lighting. The lighting has been very kind to us because lighting is um, a, a, a field that's driven by um, 
uh, technological change at the moment, and uh, and so it's quite an exciting field. And also, people um, seem quite happy to to inhabit the modern world with with lighting. So lighting is a big thing, and more latterly into accessories as well. So um, whether that's perfumes, which is a, a new adventure where I design. Uh, mainly through my nose rather than with my eyes and my hands, you know, or, um, and we also design interiors as well. So we, we do an amount of, um, of interior work as well, and, and that informs the product work. So that's quite unusual as well. And the interior design, that's a separate company? You have or a separate? It's a separate name um, because it's a service industry, not, not a product industry. So um, there you see some older work, the, the stuff I was doing for the, the, the luxury Italian brands um, uh, and, you know, some accessories there as well. So we have Capellini there, one of the early pieces, is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then some the early experiments in welding, which is the, the pylon-esque chair uh, on the right. And then up to date, this very comfortable bed that we are sitting on, or? A Okay, so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk quickly. I mean, I've been very dissatisfied. And, you know, the furniture industry is a very old-fashioned way of doing things. It's not like the tech companies or the software companies um, that, that we were uh, hearing ab about um, in, the, in the last... Um, uh, couple of chats, but what, what this is, is is really to try and attempt to mimic um, other other types of business, faster moving businesses. So um, the collaboration with IKEA is really uh, an idea where instead of trying to finish a piece of, of, of design, which is what designers tend to do to try and perfect an object, is to release a kind of platform into the world that other people can hack. So you can see that the, the shape of the of the bed frame, which is what it is, right here is very reminiscent of the iPhone 4, or is it 5? Anyway, it's got a, a, an aluminium um, uh, band around it, and, and the idea is really just like uh, the iPhone, um, you allow other people to add things on top. So it starts off as a bed, but you can convert into sofa. Um, that sofa can be adapted with extra um, covers or, or extra side tables or extra lamps. And the idea is really that rather than the kind of disposable nature of, of low-end furniture, you're, you're putting together a very high-end um, uh, frame, a bit like in, in, in the car business where you have a platform and on top of that platform several models can be made. So it's, it's destined to be a, an object that you can carry right through your life and beyond. And tell us about the, the hacking side to it, because this is something, again, you've been interested in, you're doing it yourself with the product through your own... Well, I'd noted there was a, a hacking community surrounding IKEA, which, um, which were, were actually, you know, there was one, um, one hack, which was take a cheap IKEA bowl and make yourself a cheap Tom Dixon lamp by drilling a hole in it and hanging it upside down, <laughs> which I thought was a, a, such a fabulous idea. I, that's when I noted, and IKEA had previously been trying to close down because they'd been using the IKEA logo on these websites. But I like this idea that in the modern world, people improve a product, right? And, um, and, and add things on. You can pimp this, this sofa. So we opened it up first with IKEA with, with, uh, in three art schools at Parsons in New York and Royal College in, in London and in Japan as well to 75 much, much uh, faster, younger, fresher minds than my own. And, and they added um, 75 ideas to the sofa, which some of them may well go into the IKEA. Such as? Um, well, they seemed quite terrified of, of the modern world, the students. You know, it's kind of scary to th see into the minds of all of these students in one go. A lot of them were trying to do... I think the Japanese ones were particularly raising the bed and hiding underneath in earthquakes. You know, the Indonesian ones were, were uh, making inflatable mattresses so you could float, float away if there was a flood or a tsunami. Um, a, a Chinese one was, was trying to hide from uh, the electronic rays by making a, a tent which, which stopped radiation um, underneath. So it was kind of a, a big insight into... Um, into the modern world, but more importantly, you know, I hacked it myself. So this, you can see this is very kind of, let's say, Swedish, and yeah. I'm not gonna say bland, because it's not bland, right? It's high quality. It's but um, what it does is a base for, um, for pimping the sofa. So what you see in the top right-hand corner of, of, of this image here is, is my own hack for, for this sofa, where, where the IKEA sofa vanishes completely under a massive King Kong-style Icelandic uh, sheepskin wool cover, which is at least you know, 10,000 bucks. Right? So you, you get a luxury sofa out of your, um, your student bed that you bought 10 years ago. You can, you can upgrade. Mm. That's my plan, anyway. Yeah. That's a <laughs> It's an interesting uh, business plan, yeah. You've, uh, could work. Could it's work. working already. <laughs>
But also you've hacked it, I heard, in your new studio. You've yeah, yeah, we've, we've taken this. It's actually cheaper to go to Ikea and buy a bed and turn it into a table for my new design studio. So we've bought 20 uh, Ikea um, bed frames and, and we've turned them into design, um, design desks. Hmm. I must say, actually, um, hats off to Tom for making it here because he's literally in the process of moving how many of your employees? 120. 120 are at this moment moving from West London to North London as we speak. Central so London. Central North London. <laughs> King's Cross. Used to be North London, now it's Central. But um, <laughs> everything's Central. But to, it's a, he's a brave man. His employers hate him at the moment that he's here lying on a sofa bed and talking to us. But um, moving on, other ideas and other thoughts you've had about breaking the traditional method of not only making, but distributing and retailing. Yeah, so I'm, des I'm desperately um, uh, uh, impatient with, with the way the, the, the business is, which is um, at, at the moment pretty undisrupted. I mean, obviously, you know, in this room are sitting loads of people that are involved in much faster moving, much more profitable, faster growing companies, and so I'm deeply jealous, right? So <laughs> trying to work out if there's ways of, of um, the bigger physical world becoming a bit more like uh, tech companies. And, and this is an idea which is really cribbed from Google, where you give away your service for free um, and uh, or, or your object for free and and you pay for it through other means in this case advertising so this is Trafalgar Square in London where I, I attempt to give away a thousand shares um, uh, for, for absolute for free and um, I pay for this uh, through sponsorship and it's a very it's a very um, popular event, actually. And, and you know, anyone who's been a designer, particularly in things like chairs or a retailer in, 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 in objects as well, knows how difficult it is to sell chairs. It's a very slow process. Often you're making in low-cost economies, shipping to a European warehouse and then shipping back out to the markets of the world. But in this case, I, I got rid of 1,000 chairs in six minutes, which was kind of great until <laughs> they started appearing on eBay uh, <laughs> and, and being sold for 200 pounds each. So. <laughs> And the model is, the image on the right is the, is the F1 model. It's just you know, it's the, 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 the modern world seems to, to value you know, um, the idea of spot. So anyway, in this room, if there's anyone who wants to test out this model, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'll be in the corner later. Yeah. <laughs> and then technology, of course, the, the modern day, how we're being... Yeah, so I think this is probably I don't know pertinent to Singapore or anywhere really. But you know, I think I think that there is a, a, a slow but increasingly um, uh, f fast uh, revolution happening in in how you make objects. I mean, I think most people are obsessed with rapid prototyping, which is a very slow and expensive way of making plastic expensive plastic objects. But so um, rapid prototyping has ended up being slow. No, it's it's so, going oh. to be it's going to be the future. But for the time being, I think designers have got this opportunity just like musicians did uh, 10 years ago to, to, to make their albums in their bedroom to actually just use your, your, your laptop to, to create things almost anywhere in the world. So this is an experiment. You know, before the robots take over and, and take all of our jobs, we've still got a short um, space of time where we can use the robots to our own ends, right? So um, these, these are industrial robots that are suddenly huge plants have reduced to these much smaller machines which are much more versatile. Um, and and, and, and um, they make a lot of the things that surround us anyway. Um, but normally those things are the backs of washing machines or the, the undercarriages of cars. But by harnessing and designing to suit um, the industrial robot, you can actually make something which, um, which, which can be made anywhere in the world just by sending a, a file. So you're seeing me there holding up a chair which is tailored to the um, five or six tools that this machine um, can pick up and, 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 and use. Um, and that chair is, is, uh, is in the Milan Furniture Fair, uh, making 200 chairs and then moves to New York um, to make another um, 500 lamps in the New York fair. So um, I think you know, the future will bring a, a, a very swift change in, in not only how we design things, but how we distribute them and how we manufacture them as well. So you seem to be, you say you're, you're impatient, it's clear, but, it, but in a healthy Easily way. Easily bored. Yep. Easily bored, the attention span of a, of a gnat, a yep. mosquito. But it's... Um, but it's you're pushing and you're continually trying to test these things out, even if they're not ready at the time. Yes, I'm still to make my fortune. <laughs> It'll come. Now, this project requires a bit of explanation, but it's, I've heard some of it. It's, it's fascinating and it's 
addressing nature as well as addressing yeah, this is it's, um, it's slightly less impatient in a way because uh, so so this is an idea of an underwater furniture factory. So um, I came across uh, on the internet, as you do, um, this 1970s scientist that had found a way of, of um, or had, had decided that he was going to grow islands underwater, them, underwater and float them to the surface. He discovered a way of of using. Um, metal frameworks and charging them with small quantities of electricity through solar power. Um, and, and, and those, those um, metal frameworks would um, grow a skin of natural concrete, so limestone in this case, right? So um, I, I, um, I um, tried to test this out with, with a set of, of, um, of 10 chairs and two tables in the Bahamas, because you have to do it in warm water. You can't do it in, the, in England. You have to go somewhere hot. And, um, and so these chairs have been underwater for, for four years. So you see me there fishing out the chair after one year, and it's grown a skin of concrete on, on a five millimeter metal framework, which is now um, 25 millimeters thick. And then if you leave it in for four more years, which is what, what's happened now, um, you'll see um, this massive lump of concrete accreting on the, on, on the metal framework. So this is a, a, a way of, um, of uh, obviously it's completely conceptual and, and, and those chairs are intent to sell on the uh, international art design market <laughs> because they're not actually that practical, okay? Let's yeah. be clear. But you can see on the, on the bottom right hand corner, not only do they, they grow this, um, this uh, uh, calcium carbonate, which is effectively limestone, um, they also start um, being a very good environment for sea life. So you see there's some sponges. And you can actually graft on um, coral and, and broken coral that will have been smashed off by, um, by um, you know, yachts or what have you, or divers. And, and the, the coral itself will grow five times faster than it will and without the electrical charge. So it's a way of, of, of uh, regenerating uh, coral. It's a way of, of growing concrete underwater. And it's also um, particularly interesting in, in terms of um, stopping beaches eroding as well. So um, it's got all kinds of, of different qualities. The, the framework's being um, uh, permeable rather than what normally happens with sea defenses, which is that you put in huge concrete blocks or, or stones, which, which actually um, uh, reflect the waves back. This allows the, 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 the tide to go through and slows down the waves. So it's quite good for beach erosion. So the, the, the drawing at the bottom is really me looking for another site for a much larger and more ambitious project where um, I can try and, and, and form something which not only regenerates a coral reef, but also gives me a bit like a, 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 an orchard from which I can, I can pick my, my um, designer chairs um, like fruit in the forest. Fascinating, fascinating project. We are, to remind you, we will have a few minutes for questions from the floor. So raise your, your hand in a couple of minutes when we wind up um, and look for the paddle waver. Um, just this final image, Tom, it confused and intrigued me when we received your images. What does this represent? It's not you in your early days before becoming a designer, is it? It's not. No, it was just a, a reflection. You know, people always say, well, what is design? And, and you'll hear, it's such a baggy and loose term that covers so many different activities these days. I mean, myself, I don't even consider myself as a designer particularly, but if I was to think or try and describe design as a thing, it's almost like alchemy, really. So this is an alchemist. And, you know, the idea of turning, you know, base, a base material into gold is really what we do. So just improving things, you know, improving, um, you know, the function, the materiality, the sometimes improving um, the price of an object is, is, is what design does. Excellent. So design as alchemy is, I think that's a, that's a good message. So questions, does anybody have any questions for Tom Dixon, the alchemist? One coming. Hi, Tom. And say your name, please, and your... Hi, my name is Fabrice uh, from Collection. Um, I'm the brand director of Collection. Salut. Salut Tom. <laughs> Do you believe in micro-production for distribution? Uh, can you elaborate? Uh, do you believe that we should be closer uh, to where we distribute our products when we produce our new design? 
Yeah, I think that's what's exciting, and that's what I was trying to touch on a bit earlier on, is that, is that everywhere can become a, a producing nation these days, and every designer um, has a much closer proximity to the tools of manufacturing. When I started, it was almost impossible to get anybody to make anything. But now that, that um, industrialization has become miniaturized and computerized, it, it becomes innately possible to, to produce things closer to where they're being consumed. And, and the design can kind of happen anywhere, like I say, it can happen in your bedroom, or it can happen in a studio, or it can happen next to the customer themselves. So obviously the, the difficulty in that is really how does the designer then monetize their ideas if all the idea is is a file flying around the world rather than a product that you're either making a royalty uh, on or you're supplying. Um, but it's inevitable just in the way that it's happened in publishing and it's happened in, in, in the music business that... that um, uh, the, the, the manufacturing and distribution process will get deconstructed and, and, and relocated because it's no longer about the, the price of cheap labor, which has been the, the story of the last 20 years or, or, or longer, the last 50 years, if you like, of, of manufacturing moving out of, of, um, of the Western world to much cheaper, low-wage economies. Well, the music industry is now makes its money from performance and touring rather than... In it. The actual product. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Any other question from the floor? Anything for Tom? Agnes? Mm -hmm. There's no questions. I think you've I said think it all, actually. You've answered Tom. it all, yeah, good. I think you have, you have, yes, answered all the questions. It's, um, to reiterate, Tom will also be showing his, his other skills this evening which is as a bass player. Can you not overblow that? <laughs> which syncs it up very nicely from what we talked about from the performing arts and the, and the musicians. But please, ladies and gentlemen, can we have a round of applause for Mr. Tom Dixon.